show. I um, think it is a marvelous example of the art, the quality of artists that we have very near us. Um, you know, Joan is from Naples and has been from Naples for quite a while. Uh, Marcus is from Lehigh for how many years now? Yeah. And, um, and then uh, Richard Mueller is re more recent vintage, um, but is in Venice, Florida. So, um, you know, we have, um, we've had the ability to bring in artists of an international um, notoriety, but yet just they're, they're, you know, an hour and a half away at, at most. So I um, really am proud of Southwest Florida for what we generate here and what we, what we attract here. Um, I would like to start just very briefly, if everyone who is a staff member or a faculty member in theater and visual arts could just stand up real quick so that, um, I'm not going to introduce you all, but just so that you get an eyeball of the folks who are, um, you know, the, the teachers and the influences on the students and um, everybody is active. <laughs> Yes. 
show sometimes that artists are not particularly good with every other subject in math and the sciences and geography. And sometimes, of course, they are, like Leonardo da Vinci. So I did attend all the Saturday morning art classes through high school, and then I also had a scholarship to attend Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh. And I felt very, very fortunate in the fact that even though I lived 50 miles away, I had a mother who would drive me every Saturday morning into Pittsburgh, no matter what kind of weather it was. So it, those things you remember and appreciate as you're growing up. But I've always, always appreciated realism and abstraction. And I wanted to say that I think there's a marriage between the two. And I never, never like to separate them and say one's better than the other. Because I had a friend I told to that good is good in realism or abstraction. So I guess I've said enough about what I have to offer. And I'm perhaps the oldest member here. But I feel very fortunate to have lived this long and been able to produce art. And I do work every day. I wouldn't miss a day without producing art. Because my husband just passed away recently. And that also gives me the impetus because he was very helpful. And I know that he appreciated the fact that I did the artwork and he supported me. So I just continue every day and figure that I'm going to do this for the rest of my life.
this when you want me to mention the educational bit, or is this just an intro? No, this is just who okay, you okay. are. I'll you. just do who I am. Yeah. Um, my name is Richard Mueller. I, I uh, hail from Kenmore, New York. I grew up in the States and uh, was in the Peace Corps, came back from the Peace Corps, and uh, my wife and I decided that we wanted something uh, rustic. We uh, moved to uh, Cape Breton, Nova Scotia, which is a very remote area. set up a, a life uh, in the woods where we basically uh, started with a frame of a house and spent about 15 years rebuilding it and taking it over. During that time we had two sons and uh, I, uh, it took me about eight years before I could build a studio onto the house and I did that and uh, meanwhile in the, in the process I uh, picked up uh, a job as a uh, school teacher and a principal, something I uh, I sat on the stairs the day that I accepted the job and actually tears ran down my face because it meant that I was giving up my dream or I thought it meant it was giving up my dream of making art. Um, it didn't. Uh, I, I continued to work all through that time late into the night and uh, I've done it ever since. I went on uh, in 1984. I moved to Halifax, Nova Scotia, where there's a, a very, uh, very well known conceptual school called the Nova, uh, excuse me, NASCAP, Nova Scotia College of Art and Design. And, uh, and I uh, taught at the uh, Dalhousie School of Architecture initially. I was hired then as a prof at uh, MASCAD, at the Swiss College of Design. And uh, I spent about 18 years doing that. Um, during that time, I continued to exhibit at some pretty terrific people and uh, mostly some wonderful students. So I'm grounded in pedagogy uh, very, very strongly. Um, I thought that was going to be a liability in my life. It turned out to be, in fact, a major asset. Um, I'm not sure I could even choose between teaching or art making as to which would be more beneficial and more rewarding in my life. Um, I've shown internationally. Um, I, uh, I, I'll let you read whatever it is I've done. Um, but uh, essentially, um, I, I do this rather compulsively, as Joan and I discussed. <laughs> <laughs> and so, since we were very young, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and I'm much closer to Joan's age, so she didn't feel alone. <laughs> uh, so, but uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful choice, uh, as, in fact, is the choice of uh, the teaching in the schools. And uh, I've been asked at some point, we'll get into discussing right. yes. some, of the, some of the reasons why that's such a wonderful life and uh, such an important life. Years. It was 
standing there. And I had collectors come in and say, you know what, this is, this is really interesting. <laughs> so I started taking a closer look at the color palette. And uh, I actually started seeing uh, very similar to what I saw in the comments, which was the aerial view uh, of, a, uh, of a landscape. So I worked on that and started exploring that and see what I could actually carve out of it. Because most of my paintings aren't really pre preconceived or anything that sort of really come out of a chance and accident. Really? You just compose as you go? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, there's no preconceived notion as to what the painting's going to look like in the end or anything. That's it's just very surprising. interesting considering how large your paintings yeah, are. Yeah, yeah. No, I have no idea what, you know, what the painting's going to look like at all. As a matter of fact, uh, I have generally you know, I have a general concept as far as subject matter and so forth, but um, there's no uh, end result or anything. And I like exploring it as it goes along, so it gives me the opportunity to explore the painting. Um, and, and so I explore it, and as I do the two-dimensional, I do the, the three-dimensional the same way, which is more, really more of a carving out of the painting than uh, actually applying uh, paint, knowing where I'm going, so it's, uh, which I find interesting. And um, that's how the three-dimensional paintings actually came about. So I started looking at it, and the first two sold, I think, within the first, uh, as soon as I showed them, and I said, well, that's interesting, so I yeah. started, started looking, looking more at that. So, <laughs> So, kind of right now. Well, yeah, you know, I just started looking, looking at it more, and um, so this has been, uh, I've only done, I think, like maybe six three-dimensional paintings so far. So this is really a new approach for me, just started uh, end of last year, 2011, and um, this is something I'm still, like I said, still exploring, so this is from the two-dimensional works, it's not two Right, and it's interesting because you were saying that you had originally developed these aerial views as aerial view, so she yeah. viewed flat, but then when you were at Scope, that during Art Basel this past year, your gallerists in Miami had decided to hang them on the wall, um, which, that, that was new for you, or that... Um, yeah, that was, that was new as far as the three-dimensional pieces are concerned. I had a collector that came in and bought the, uh, the first one that was created, which was called The Overseer, uh, and he came to the studio and he, he, he bought it uh, immediately, so it was, I believe, Show. I really wanted to show that particular piece, uh, and uh, as I was gone, so I showed the baby, the uh, Rockabye baby, which, which you have here at the university now. And uh, so that one actually showed at Art Basel. Um, and um, you know, so so that was uh, it, it's a new it's a new venue. I'm exploring it and whatnot. Uh, I like it. It's very spontaneous. Most of my work is very spontaneous. There's no, uh, like I said, uh, you know, sketching or anything involved. It's, it's just a simple, more impulsive. Probably more like uh, action painters used to work, you know, where, where it's just simply applied directly. And, uh, I'm going to ask something that I'm sure folks are interested in. Um, you've got a um, a brand mark that runs consistently through your work. Uh -huh. um, you've got the, the Target, and then you've got um, a uh, a tire. Yeah. Um, and so those those crop up. So, right. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, the, the tires started uh, a long time ago. I would say maybe five or six years ago, and uh, I've been doing that consistently. It sort of became maybe a random part of the composition, but um, uh, initially it was sort of uh, the tires represented me and my maybe the mileage that I left behind, the more symbolic meaning. A lot. I use a lot of um, you know uh, collage elements as, as uh, in, in symbolic terms. And um, uh, but there's no end meaning to the work. And, uh, you know, my work uh, personally, I leave open to interpretation as far as uh, what people read into it and so forth. I think I'm more concerned about uh, having an impact on people and having them engage in the work uh, in, in some way and having them critically uh, analyze the work. And, you, know, you know, frankly, I mean, I, you know, I've had you know critics write uh, things that uh, I thought maybe were completely off from what I yeah. sort of maybe thought, but but that's fine because that's the whole idea. <laughs> So it's more about the dialogue to me and um, uh, deciphering the words somehow. Well, it's very powerful. Very powerful. Um, Joan, do you want to talk about, we have two of your pieces that are separated in time, but they are from a single, or three plates that you had created, that you had etched. Yes. Um, and um, there's about a 20, 
25-year period of period. time because I was doing many, many etchings for years and years. And I did all the things that you shouldn't do. I bought jugs of uh, nitric acid and carried them for miles in snowy weather. I could have blown up. I mean, with this nitric acid. But I was so excited about what I was doing with these plates that I couldn't really work in a workshop with anybody. So I would work in the backyard with these plates and put the ground on and etch them and then put them in a bath of nitric acid and water. And I would love to see them smoke. If I could see the smoke building up, I figured I was really doing something that was grand with these plates. I liked them gritty and burnt. So anyway, I threw, which was also bad, I was throwing the acid water over the hillside. <laughs> but, no, that's, but I had these four kids, a dog, a gerbil, and a cat. So I had to do these before the kids came home. And I was dumping this nitric acid over the hillside. Then I come in and I would clean off these plates. And I was so excited with the imagery because I had a grandfather who said that he was all Native American. People would say to him, Dave Bell, what part of Europe did you come from? He said, no ma'am, he says all American. He said, so I assumed from that that I could do this Native American imagery. So my plates involved all this Native American imagery, which I was excited about because of my so-called heritage. <laughs> so well, the other interesting part is my son's into genealogy, and he said, did you know, he said that your great-grandmother sewed pillows in a brothel.
I wouldn't want to stay in the same place forever. I'd be so bored. I want to keep doing something that's different, something unique out there. And I guess uh, I'm excited, and it keeps me going because, like I'm saying, is uh, Marcus and I both lost our spouses, and that leaves you with a void. There's nothing that's, it leaves you with a void more than that, except losing a son, and I lost a son, too. But this art does give you that emotional balance. It makes you feel vital. And I feel like every day it's an opportunity for me. And I don't feel quite so lonesome in the house if I can get up every morning and say, I'm going to produce something. I'm going to work on something. And it gives me that feeling that my husband is still here, that my family is still around me. Because, you know, I'm all alone in Florida and hoping the family moves in with me. <laughs> well, you have to move some of your paintings. I <laughs> Everybody laughs because when they come in the house, I have all these paintings all over the floors. And you can't find the furniture. <laughs> because the furniture supports the paintings. <laughs> Shredded paper. It happens that the shredded paper is the Encyclopedia Britannica. Uh, 
Um, so I collected the Britannica, uh, which I had actually that we bought in the, in the early 70s for my kids when they were born, thinking, oh, that we've got to have an encyclopedia in the house. Uh, and at one point when I, when I sold my family home years ago, I realized uh, I didn't know what to do with this encyclopedia. And in some hours it was, not only was it out of date, literally, in the sense of, but it was out of date in the sense of what it represented. Um, so, uh, I had it in my studio and I sort of piled it up and I thought, oh, that's interesting, I'm going to think about it. So finally I, I shredded the encyclopedia. And then I had this, this form, form built in which I could actually bail it. So I, uh, I would spritz the paper after it was shredded with moisture, with water, and, uh, and a, a bit of a, a resin in it, just to, just to sort of give it some body. And, um, and then once it was wet, I compacted it into this, into these, this form. And then I took these plastic ties and I, I actually bailed it. Um, so, I mean, uh, and I think this is significant in perhaps much work that you look at, is the notion between uh, sort of figurative and literalness in work. Um, I, I don't paint landscapes, I don't make portraits, I don't make reference very often to, to real things, and you know, quote real things in my work. I'm much more interested in the um, in the figurative, that is, how, how things actually imply uh, significance and associations in the, in the world that we live in. So this, these shredded pieces of paper were bailed, and then from there I began to photograph them. And, uh, and on that wall, I think the next piece of that wall is, is titled Bad Thoughts. And I, I began to see these shreds of paper as thoughts. I thought, well, you know, if I imagine uh, the shredded encyclopedia as being kind of symbolic of thoughts, um, I can treat those thoughts in a number of ways, and I'm interested in, in philosophical questions. So I thought, what would bad thoughts look like? And I began to play with bad thoughts. And so there's a, there's a, there's a piece in that show that is, that the next one is, which is essentially uh, titled Bad Thoughts. Um, and then um, Bad Thoughts sort of evolved, and I, was, I happened to be, I, I had available to me through my partner uh, access to some other bales, and one of them happened to have monthly payments in one of the strips. So I you'll see there's a piece titled Monthly Payments. <laughs> That's interesting. So it has a whole other actually that sort of quality to it. And, and then um, I, I, I'm trained as a sculptor and I don't really paint. This goes back to the, like a comment on postmodernism. Um, I, I don't really see my work as paintings. I see my work as really sculptures of paintings. And that's kind of a, should be an important distinction because um, it's, it's once removed. So I don't see them as real, I see them as representations of the real. Um, and, and, and so in that sense, I took these, uh, these pieces of, uh, of the encyclopedia, pages of the encyclopedia, I laminated uh, the encyclopedia between uh, two, two layers of paper with a sheet of metal in between. I then cut the strips of metal and then by hand reconfigured those into strips, of, so shreds. So that if you saw one on the floor, it would look like a piece of shredded paper. Um, and then I thought that was interesting, and, and I loved the kind of linear quality. So my, my sort of formalist uh, sort of tendencies kicked in. I thought, oh, that's a, I, I like that kind of linear, general sort of uh, energy that this that these shreds of paper have, as as all of them, if they were marks of pencil or, or paint. And I did these drawings, and there's a drawing, the final piece on that particular wall is a drawing. Uh, quote, <laughs> which removes it from being a drawing, unquote, uh, and, and it's, it's, it's really a play with this notion of, of shreds of paper acting as lines, acting as drawings, and in fact they're three-dimensional because they project out from the wall and the lighting becomes a component of the drawing as well. Okay.
if you um, have your creativity cut off, it is like not getting 100% oxygen flow, in my mind. Um, we, from time to time, there are uh, different ideas about state, federal, local uh, budgets, and where do we cut the fat, and often the um, arts are considered the fat. You know, what, what we would do and we would carry that on, we wouldn't necessarily go home and do calculus um, in our spare time, but we would paint or draw. And so I think that that's part of, maybe that's part of the reasoning why that's you know, seen as the easy part to trim off. But I think that um, that does a disservice to, to our children and to um, ourselves, um, you know, as older Americans, <laughs> to Americans. To Americans. Um, that's right. That's right. Um, Native American. Um, that um, you know we're doing something to our future if we are taking away, um, nourishing that creative side of our minds. And so um, enough of my soapbox. I just wanted to get just. Just an opinion. If anybody else had something to add, too, it was just just a um, ending note, and then Baron, I'll turn it over to you. I had, I had a question. Yes. If I may, each one of you seems to evolve your works through a conversation with the piece, and and uh, a conversation I've had a number of times with students. I was interested to see to hear how you come to the state where you feel a piece is finished. Well, that's, you know, that, you know, that, you know, that, you know well, I mean, for me, you know, I'm for me, but uh, that's, you know, I mean, what is, what is uh, making a painting? It's, uh, you know, it's a, we're talking about decision making, so you're making decisions while you're going through this process of painting. And at some point you come to a point of saying, okay, well, this is something that has some value, that you have some, uh, that shows some importance to you personally. Finish it. Is a painting ever finished? You can continue a painting as long as you want. As, many, as a matter of fact, you know, I get paintings sometimes. I have paintings laying around the studio for, for a long time, and I'll take them back and start painting them, you know, painting on them again. So, uh, is, is there a finish to a painting? Probably not. You know, it's just a matter of you know, you're showing it at some point. People respond to it, but uh, the artists, uh, you yeah, know, but for me personally, uh, you know, I could take pretty much any painting. I go over many paintings that I have. Um, so I don't know if there is a finish. Is there a finish in life? It's a, uh, a simple question. I'll, I'll volunteer. <laughs> uh, I, I, have, uh, I have a luxury in my life of having a retrospective. <laughs> and uh, it was an interesting thing to suddenly walk into a, to a gallery, a large gallery, and um, I remember I was part of the installation. I worked through it uh, with, a, with a terrific staff. And I, I left, and they had sort of cleaned up and done all the finishing to make it look terrific. And uh, I remember coming in earlier the, before the opening, and um, I had this moment to walk around the gallery above. And I, and I realized um, that I never really have any work, one individual work, uh, that is finished, or that I, even, I don't care about the finished state of it. It, it resolved a particular sort of moment of, uh, uh, in which I was working. But, but the interesting thing to me at that point was that um, my work really was about 20 years, and, and I can say I can say that out of 40 years. Uh, and, and any one of the works just represented a point on a continuum. Um, and, so, and I realized that I was always, always moving. I had no particular place of where I was going. I didn't know where I was going. In fact, it's a great quote I wanted to mention to you that I heard recently um, by E.L. Doctor, a novelist, an American novelist. And he said that like, make, creating a novel is really like uh, driving down a very, very dark road and you know nothing except what the headlights show you. And, and your, your, your destination is determined only by virtue of the, the headlights. And so you're, you're turning here and suddenly you realize you're in the woods, you're in the river, or whatever. And, I mean, and that really is, to me, that was precisely the way I feel when I'm working. And I can say that's precisely the way I've lived my life, frankly. 
I, I, uh, I just got a flashlight and, uh, and I basically shine it around. Hey, that looks good. And, and, and that to me is, is, is how I guess I want to explain how any one work has significance. Does anybody else have any questions that they would like to ask?
and then I find a sense of composition in the way that I like and stick with that and then sort of explore that. But um, uh, yeah, I think I think that can be uh, that can be a tool that can be used for me. Frustration. I think the frustration happens so many times. I'm a little bit hard of hearing. I'm at the age where I've approached this hearing business, and that's a little frustrating. <laughs> so I, I try to hear everything, and sometimes I miss certain points. But it is frustrating sometimes when you're working on a work and you think that you're going somewhere. And maybe people come in and they say, what are you doing? I don't really like it. And that's frustrating. But you do continue to work and improve yourself. And there's a lot of frustrations in art. But there's also, there's so many benefits that I, I feel like the benefits overwhelm the frustrations. If I heard you correctly. I think art teaches you patience, too. Patience. Yeah. Patience, yeah. Something I don't have in patience. Which is noticeable by patience. Right, right. Which, which yeah. Which yeah. Which right. Right. That's why I'm expressionist. I think the frustration, right. <laughs> <laughs> frustration is to do something that I, I would absolutely not necessarily want to do. Yeah. <laughs> and, and then leave the studio. <laughs> <laughs> and then come back later and discover that what I had done actually really, really solved an issue. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But I, I just, before we do, I don't want you to close without addressing this because you'd ask me to think about it. And uh -huh. I, I'd like to say it because I believe in this very deeply. Uh, Annika asked if I just mentioned something about, I have taught, I've taught all the way from elementary, I mean, and I mean like little people, all the way to graduate level studies. And um, I believe very, very deeply in arts education. And so you asked if, I, if we might think about that. What I'd like to uh, comment on is, is this notion. I, I decided I would, I would reduce it to two issues, or to two sort of poles, uh, one being implicit, the other being explicit. Um, I think we have an educational system which is hell-bent on the explicit. It wants things explained, it wants things labeled, it wants things rationalized, it wants things certain. And, uh, and, and much of what our schools move toward is uh, our testable ideas and testable information. I would argue that, in fact, much of the value to being a human being is on the implicit end of the scale. And uh, the implicit nature of art itself, uh, to me, is so, so critical because it's only in that, in that ability to deal with figurative ideas, with uh, expressionistic ideas, and, uh, and with um, implicit meanings. Uh, and those implicit meanings are critical to medicine, they're critical to good science, they're, implicit, they're, they're critical to any, any discipline. And uh, I, I worry sometimes our schools are missing the real significance of what this is about. So uh, that's my show. I really Uh, painting since 1997, 
um, in his private collection for his family, and now in Unit A, it's 7,000 square feet, we're displaying them for the public. So every art walk uh, downtown Fort Myers will have these on display for anyone to come in and um, talk to me about it, be giving directors tours, uh, things like that, and ask any questions about maybe what they were inspired by and how they were made. So March 2nd is our grand opening, and also students, anyone that would like to volunteer that night also to help um, educate the public on the work, I'd be happy to educate you and we can spread that knowledge. Thank you. I think we have a question. Yes. Where is the gallery located? The gallery is on the corner of Evans and Thompson in downtown Fort Myers. So it is part of downtown uh, we are looking into, and I think we have secured a trolley system from Space 39, is located right uh, in the patio of the Leon, downtown Fort Myers, to get you there. Otherwise, we have a parking lot. You can certainly drive. I think parking is going to be better over there than a lot of downtown yeah, Fort Myers. Yeah, so probably. You may so really want to start parking there. lots around our building, um, but I, I really recommend it because I think it's something very fresh and new for Fort Myers. I think it's really the future for downtown Fort Myers that we keep adding, you know, important art, but, you know, for, for everyone.